Let me first introduce uh, my co-host, Michael Greshler. He is the SMARTS director. He does absolutely all the things at Research ILD and SMARTS and is a fantastic teacher. So you're gonna be hearing a bunch from him. Um, and then we have uh, uh, Caitlin Vanderberg, who is our wonderful SMARTS intern, who's been invaluable in helping with uh, all of the uh, various things that we have to do online and then with our uh, clinical work. So, so this is just our short, uh, this is our short agenda. So we're gonna talk a little bit about exploring executive function in context and context meaning both in school and remote and in between. The impact of remote and hybrid learning and the supporting student, student success. And then we're gonna talk about five concrete steps that you can use tomorrow to get started. Uh, but first off, let's talk a little bit about who we are. So uh, we are uh, a couple of different uh, institutes that work together. First is the Research Institute for Learning and Development. Um, and that is our research arm. That's probably who found us. Uh, we create curriculum and we do trainings with teachers about learning differences and executive function. And uh, we'd love it if you checked out our website. Uh, then we also have our sister organization, which is the Institute for Learning and Development. This is where we have our uh, teachers who work directly with students one on one. And we're doing that, of course, uh, online now. So uh, we usually are in Lexington, Massachusetts. So we do in person when that is available. But also, uh, since we're doing it online, if you have a special student in your life who needs that kind of one on one help, you should contact us. All right. And then, um, so our wonderful uh, director and founder, Dr. Lynn Meltzer, our president, she is the of both the uh, research ILD and uh, ILD. Uh, she is a she was associate education at Harvard Grad School of Education and many, many, many other accolades. She is an absolute leader in the field for over 30 years. Uh, she has done some, she has made some fantastic uh, books that are wonderful, wonderful guides for uh, using EF strategies in the classroom. So everything that you see here that we are doing has really been underpinned by her meticulous research uh, for her entire career. A uh, personal favorite of these books is The Green Book. It is, it's a really fantastic practical resource. So if you're wondering, that is where we are getting all of our uh, materials. Okay, and then finally, um, Smarts Online is our uh, curriculum that was created through Research ILD that is online. And uh, it is the thing that most of our teachers are actually using in their schools. It is actually two curriculums. There is an elementary curriculum and a secondary school curriculum. Each curriculum has 30 lessons each and each lesson uh, goes over uh, major strategies for teaching executive function and there's executive function cogs uh, that we, uh, categories that we go through and each lesson has worksheets and PowerPoints and all sorts of supplementary materials as well. So a lot of things we talk about today are also part of the SMARTS curriculum. Um, if you are a SMARTS teacher already, let us know in the chat. It's always nice to see you. And if you're interested in SMARTS, you should contact us and we can tell you more about the program. There's also a lot of free information on the SMARTS website itself. Okay. Uh, and then finally, so this series that we're doing right now is our free webinar series. This is really a uh, overview of uh, various executive function practices. However, we have put together a meticulous uh, and extensive online uh, training that is really, really uh, at a different level. Um, so this is our executive function essentials, a comprehensive toolkit uh, for remote and in-class learning. So this is a series of paid trainings. Um, and as we say, these ones are, they're going to be, uh, Dr. Lynn Meltzer is actually going to be leading many of them. They have some special content areas, including how to use EF with math, dyslexia. Um, and then we also wanted to uh, give you for attending this free webinar, a special discount. So uh, we'll be putting a discount code if you're interested in any of these uh, trainings into the chat. Um, we actually have, this will give you $20 off each training. Then there's how many other, Michael? Nine, is that right? 
Um, and how many trainings? Do you have any trainings? I think there are six total. Six total. Yeah. Um, and then we also have a, uh, if you buy them as a bundle, you also get a discount for that as well. So this is, uh, this discount code is only for uh, people who are attending this webinar series. Um, and again, it gives you $20 off and it expires on the 22nd. So wanted to give you a little gift for joining us here today. Okay, so let's get into it. So exploring executive function in context. All right. So as you remember from the first webinar that we did, these are the elements of executive function. So, all right. Um, first we have organizing uh, and prioritizing, shifting flexibility, accessing working memory and self-checking. Now there are many definitions of an executive function out there and many different uh, people have many different categories that they choose to break executive function strategies into, but these are the ones that we are using. All right, so that's just a little refresher from last time. Okay, um, and then we wanna make sure that uh, you realize that of course, executive function, it doesn't happen in a vacuum, okay? That uh, metacognition, motivation and effort and self-concept all interact with each other to affect our students' executive function strategies and skills. So we have to look at each of these things and really evaluate how they're affecting executive function strategies. It's not this one thing that you learn separately from everything else. And that's a lot about what we're gonna talk about today because we're in all of these strange circumstances and all of these new and odd ways that we have to go about our schooling are really affecting our students' executive function. So let's talk uh, a little bit about the funnel. So the clogged funnel is our sort of classic metaphor for what is happening when a student who has the cognitive ability and experience to perform a given academic task, and yet they're still not able to do it. So what is happening there, okay? So uh, executive function where you have too many things that you have to do, where uh, you have to uh, do all sorts of tasks at the same time, somebody who has poor executive function can't sort of sort and choose which tasks do I do first? What, how do I handle this? And they all clump together and then they find themselves stuck and they can't do anything. So that's really the distinction. Um, and so this is something that, of course, our uh, students struggle with. So they're clogged when the demands placed upon them exceed their capacity. Without the ability to break down a task and prioritize the steps, they just become overwhelmed and they shut down. Um, so a classic example of this is a student who forgot an answer that they already know when they're taking a test. They know it, but because there's so much happening, they forgot. Now, a thing we wanna mention really distinctly right now is that all of our executive function is being tested at this moment in time. So we really like to acknowledge and make clear that all teachers are going through this as well. We have to, I have so many windows open to my computer now we're doing this very training that we're doing, and that's a lot more things to think about. So that's something that uh, as we go through here and we kind of isolate how you can help your students deal with this sort of unprecedented situation we have where we're doing all this virtual learning, we're not judging teachers at all. Everybody, all of you, we're making up sort of systems of how to teach this way out of whole cloth. And uh, context for different classes are different and different school systems are different. And so everything just isn't very clear. Um, so we wanna make sure that uh, as we're going through this, we acknowledge what you're going through um, and that these are suggestions for ways that you can help kind of make sense of this jump. So uh, yeah, raise your hand if that's been, that's been you over the last couple, couple of, uh, of months. So we're gonna do a uh, interesting uh, activity here that's about the zone of proximal development. So what's the zone of proximal development? So this is just an exercise that we can do to kind of figure out what tasks we think a student should be able to do and when. So um, what should our students be able to do independently? 
what should they be able to do with guidance and, and support, and what is beyond their current abilities. So every skill develops this way. So every skill that you learn, there's something you can, can't do yet, then you can do it with support, and then you can do it, with, do it independently. And EF skills are the same. But it's really important to specifically break down what you, your school system uh, is asking of students, what you are asking with your class. And it's also important to break this down for individual students. Um, because a lot of the time what's happening is it's not that a student can't do a task, it's that they are not developmentally ready to do something entirely on their own or to do multiple things entirely on their own and they need more supports. So we're gonna break down kind of exactly what this means and how to judge what it is in the next uh, thing. So what effect uh, does, uh, does uh, have in our setting? have on our students' executive function strategies. That's what we're talking about now. So setting meaning being in school, being at home, being some mix in between the two. So uh, as opposed to just telling you what I think is the case, we're gonna do this uh, together. So we are going to do a little activity. We used this last time in the uh, webinar session. We're gonna have you do the annotate um, feature with us. So if you're not sure how to annotate, you go up to view options, which is next to the little green thing at the top, or you're saying where you're viewing research ILD screen, and then you go down to annotate. Okay. And then, all right. Um, we are going to ask you to use the stamp option. You can use whatever stamp you want. You can use hearts and stars and check marks if you like. And then we're going to do a little just sample. One. So just to make sure that we all know what we're doing for annotating, um, if you yeah, we've already got some votes here. What is the best pet to have? Controversial topic. Oh, wonderful. I see you. Everybody's got a lot of dogs, got a lot of cats, some plants and a lot of nothing. Okay, great. So, all right. So I think we basically know what we're doing here. So let's do five, four, three, two, one, and finish those. Okay, excellent. All right, so if you could stop uh, annotating on that one, we're gonna advance to the next, great. So I'm glad we all know what we're doing there. All right, so now we're gonna look at three student profiles and we are going to review three tasks with a high executive function demand, all right? So we're gonna use the annotate feature to vote. Um, and we're gonna say, you're gonna vote on the zone of proximal development. Do you think this student can accomplish a task independently with support or is it something that they can't do yet? Um, and we may, depending on time, we may have to skip one or two of these, we'll see. All right, so let's look at our first student here. Okay, Adrian, um, he is, I'm going to read his profile and then we're gonna look at the tasks. So no need to annotate yet. Um, Adrian, he is a seven year old boy. He moved to a new school this year in the middle of the year and has never attended in person this school. Um, he has explosive fights with the siblings, excels, on math test and does well with praise in a one-on-one -on -one setting. <clears throat> so this is the EF task, organize his workspace. Do you think that he can't do it yet? He can do it with support or can do independently. <clears throat> okay, we just have some can't do yet. We have a good number of can do with support, interesting. And we have none that can do independently. So we know that this is something we have to think about. That we have to help support him with um, more than we even potentially were thinking about. Okay, so excellent. Thank you so much. We'll go on to the next one here. Okay, so what about this EF task? Play a math game to reinforce a new skill. So can he do this independently? Can do with support or can't do yet? All right, so this is this is a lot different. So I think we, we have a pretty good consensus, consensus that nobody thinks that they can't do it yet. Um, a lot think they can do that independently and we have sort of a medium amount with support. So that's something that's also great to add to our profile of Adrian. And then next, use uh, unstructured time productively. So do we think Adrian can use a constructive time? Wow, we've got a lot, everybody's on there saying can't do yet. Absolutely. I got a few with support, but so that's something that we know that with this student, we really have to look out for. 
Okay, excellent. Oh, that was great. Okay, great. Let's let's go on to our next student here. Okay, so Linda. Linda is a 12-year-old girl. She struggles with anxiety, especially in social situations. Parents are getting divorced. She's an avid reader and loves to draw, attends an academically rigorous private school that has been in person all year. So let's look at the first task. So organize her workspace. Who says that she can do this independently, can do with support, it can't do yet. Excellent, we got a lot of this with support. And the part of the reason why we're bringing her up is that we're talking about in context. So her context is extremely different than Adrian. She is in an academically rigorous private school that's been in person. So the load on her is different. She might have a higher load because they might be asking a lot of her, but they've also been in person. So maybe they've had more of those structures in place. So that's kind of a mix, mix of each one of those. Okay, great. So we'll clear that pot. Excellent, let's go on to the next one. You all are very fast on the annotate. Great job. Um, all right, next, play a math game to reinforce a new skill. So where do we think this falls on the zone of proximal development? Oh, we've got a good number of can do with support. We've got a good number of can do independently. Oh, interesting, a little bit of a split there. So play a math game to reinforce a new skill. It's independent. So that's something that we have to think about with her. But uh, all right, that's that's interesting. It's actually a bit more split than I was expecting. I like it. All right, let's do the next one here. Okay, um, use unstructured time productively. So this is the same one as Adrian. So let's see how the change, where do we think between Adrian who was seven um, and uh, Oh, Leanna, I said Linda, didn't I, Leanna? Um, uh, see where the difference is. So that's a huge difference. And it's what you would expect when somebody, as kids get older, they move through the zones of proximal development and become more developmentally uh, appropriate for them to do, uh, as opposed to, we don't have almost anyone who's uh, in the can't do yet. It's can do with support and can do independently. So let's do the next one here. All right. And we're gonna go look at our final student. This is Drew, he's our oldest um, and he's a 16 year old boy. He ADHD is suspected, but not diagnosed. So parents report he's completely inattentive at home and needs constant redirection. In honor science, uh, his room is extremely messy. He's quiet in class and seems to enjoy outdoor activities. So let's look at the first EF task organize his workspace. So this is the same as before. So where do we think this is gonna land? Yes. So while Drew is older than uh, Leanna, um, he's in a really different context than she is. So uh, she's, in, uh, she's in an academically rigorous school and she is in person, whereas we know that Drew is probably struggling with ADHD and he probably needs more support. So we're really pointing this out to basically be like, you can, it, that not every kid is in the same area when it comes to the things that they can do independently or with support or can't do yet. Okay, let's look at the next one. All right. So how about play a math game to reinforce a new skill? Where do we think that he would fall on this one? So we've got some can do independently, can do with support. I think that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, and that's for sure, that's, that's very much the same as the last one where it was a mixture of can do independently and can do with support. I think that makes sense, enjoys activities. Excellent. All right, and let's go on to the final one here. Okay, um, use unstructured time productively. So we're... Yes, I, I was definitely expecting there to be a lot of can't do yet and can do with support. Because uh, again, we see right here through his little description that he is struggling at home and that he needs constant redirection. So that is something that we just have to keep in mind and we have to keep that uh, with us as we try to help design, how do we give him the supports that he needs to actually be able to do the work that we already know he can do? Okay, excellent. Oh, well, thank you so much for doing that activity. I'm going to hand it over 
uh, to Michael for a moment to kind of sum us up there. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I am so happy to be here for this one. I love listening to you present. It is really fun. So, and it was also really fun to see all of you fill that out. Um, we wondered how that activity would go and you guys did great. So A plus there. Um, but just to debrief a little bit on what we saw. Uh, so often we talk about executive function and we see students struggling. We talk about, you know, some kind of biologically based, you know, neurobiological basis for those EF struggles. Remember we said Drew has ADHD or, you know, maybe um, we might've said the youngest student, you know, has something going on with those explosive fights, right? Um, and it's very easy to say, if you have ADHD, you're gonna be messy, you're gonna be scattered, but we need to look past that. You know, same thing with developmental age. It's not that unusual to say that a seven-year-old can't organize their belongings, right? Like that's to be expected. Um, but we are in charge of context. As teachers, we cannot control kids' uh, biology. We can't control their developmental age. We can control the context we put them in. And if you think about it, um, that shift in context explained a lot of those choices that you made. When you knew that the youngest kid had never been in school in person, you knew that he was really gonna struggle to organize his workspace. Um, when we knew that Liana, the middle one, had been in school, we knew that she would have more support in organizing her workspace. So as teachers, we really wanna focus on creating context where students are supported. Because if you take that uh, ZPD chart and you make it into something that looks more like this, you can really see how that context comes into play. When you push a kid beyond their capacity and you don't have supports, you're gonna get can't do yet immediately. That funnel is gonna be clogged in two seconds. However, when their abilities are an, a, in excess of what you're asking to do, they're going to be more confident and independent learners. So as educators, especially during this total cockamamie time, it's our job to try to craft a context where kids feel supported in the work that they're doing. And that's what we're gonna kind of move into because executive function happens in context, regardless of their biolog biology, regardless of their developmental age, it's happening in a certain setting. And that's the place, place where we can have the best impact on our kiddos. So now let's take that lesson that we've learned and bring it into this uh, crazy world of remote and hybrid learning. Because man, when, when I wrote those profiles for kids, I was, and I, I, I almost should have left it in, but like, you know, that oldest kid, he might have been in person and then next week remote without any notice. And that's not just true for him, but the teachers too. Same thing with that youngest kid. He probably thought he was gonna be in person and he wasn't. So those rapid and dramatic shifts from unexpected learning settings has really wrecked havoc on all of us. And one thing, I and I just wanna chime in what Elizabeth said, you know, we all have had some clogged funnels. We are all kind of building the plane as we fly it. So as we move in and look at some of the unfortunately negative impacts of remote and hybrid learning on EF. We are not doing this to point fingers or judge any educators. But if we take ownership, then we can develop strategies. We can unclog our own funnels, okay? Build our own self-awareness, our own self-concept. So we're gonna move into this. It might give some people some anxiety. No judgment there, okay? We're here to learn and grow together. Um, so this is me. I'm just gonna talk through what something used to look like in person and what it looks like now in remote, okay? So I'm gonna pretend that I'm a math teacher, kind of a fun thing to pretend to be. I don't know, is it fun to be a math teacher? Maybe, probably, um, but it's fun to pretend. All right, so I'm gonna be a math teacher and I'm going to give my kids some homework. So when the class starts, we're all together. I'm going to introduce a concept and do it up on my fancy smart board. Um, I'm going to model how to solve the problem. Students are going to practice it in the context of the class. We're going to check it together and see if they got it right. And even that one kid who's very shy, who doesn't want to speak up when they missed it, they, their next door neighbor speaks up and they get to hear that explanation and they get to check their understanding. They get to ask questions, all with support. I'm going to assign the homework. I'm going to say it out loud and I'm going to write it on the board and I'm going to give them time to write it in their planner. Um, they can check the details of the assignment. And once again, that shy kid maybe not doesn't say anything, but the kid next door does, and they get that verbal reinforcement. I am expecting my middle school students, I'm a middle school math teacher, I'm gonna expect my middle school students to do the homework on their own independently. And then when they come back together, I say, okay, everyone, please submit your work. So with support, I ask them to turn their homework in. Now, let's see what that looks like under remote. 
yes, I can still get my Zoom class together and I can still introduce concepts and model, but they're practicing it independently. I cannot see if they're, you know, scribbling with their pencil. I cannot see if they're checking it. It's, it's their responsibility to check it and they don't get to hear the questions that their friends are asking, okay? I'm going to assign homework, but it's in Google Classroom. I'm not really giving them the same verbal reminder to write it down in their planner. And they are gonna to have to take it on themselves to ask for directions. Not only do they do the work independently, they turn in the work independently because I'm asking them to submit their work on Google Classroom and I'm not giving them that verbal reminder at the start of class the way I normally did. So notice that on the in-person instruction, there was only one thing that they had to do totally independently. But on the remote instruction, they had to do a lot more independently. A lot more things are getting pushed into the Can't Do Yet for students who do not have the executive function strategies mastered to navigate all those different challenges. So every single one of those, you know, and as we know, you know, if you work with students, uh, you'll know that this is, could be a clogged funnel. A lot of kids, even in person, struggle to complete their homework. But now there are five areas where this process could break down for my kids. Okay, so that happens. We cannot necessarily change the reality of, you know, that we're doing remote instruction. However, we have to do what we can to take responsibility because students are not going to notice oh, I'm really struggling with checking my work independently. They aren't going to have that wherewithal to navigate these things and analyze those challenges. This is a real quote. We're about to go through a real example. Elizabeth is gonna lead us through an example. These are, this is a real student of mine, okay? He told me, I don't have any homework. I'm doing great in my classes. I'm getting it all done in class. Everything's going great. And then uh, two weeks before the end of the quarter, he finds out he's failing, okay? So that is what's gonna happen if we cannot develop some EF strategies to support kids and unclog those funnels. So Elizabeth, if you're ready, um, go ahead and take us through this example. Okay, all right. So Cameron um, is a junior at a large public high school. Uh, and, oops, pardon me. All right, here we go. Um, last year he got a 3.0 GPA, though he struggled with missing assignments. This year, he thought the year was going well, but with two weeks left in the semester, he got a rude awakening. He's failing in gym and math. How did it happen? So let's break it down and see what's actually going on here. We'll dig deeper into the homework. So first, where is uh, Cameron supposed to find his homework assignments? Where and when is he supposed to turn them in? How does he know if an assignment is missing? So let's actually check in uh, with some of his teachers and actually see what's going on there. So where is he supposed to find his homework assignments? So let's see about his gym teacher. The gym teacher says, all the assignments are listed in Google Classroom on the calendar. This is also where the Zoom link is posted. Some homework is must do while other assignments are should do and others are do if you want. So, okay, it's all there. So we can see that it's a little confusing, but okay, it makes sense. But now let's look at what another one of his teachers say. So his math teacher, Assignments are posted on the class stream view of Google Classroom. This is also where you can find do nows, discussion boards, and links to sample mental videos. So this is a whole different way of organizing the class. So poor Cameron probably doesn't even know where his homework assignments are because it's really, really easy for those sorts of uh, to not have the EF processes in place to remember this class has them here, this class has them here, those names sound the same. So it's really easy to just lose those assignments where Cameron actually could do them if he could find them. So this is something we can work on to try to make things match uh, between various classes to take some of that uh, take some of that off the student of having to do that all independently. Where and when is he supposed to turn them in? Let's look at what our gym teacher says. Assignments must be uploaded every Sunday night, every other week. Some assignments ask uh, students to upload a video of themselves while others may ask students to submit a short writing assignment through Google Docs. Okay, um, so that I can already see some places where we're potentially gonna have problems, but let's look at the math teacher first. So math teacher, there are two types of assignments. IXL problems must be completed by logging into the student's IXL account. There are also PDF scans of the math textbook that must be filled out using um, 
Cami, is that how you say it? Um, and uploaded to Classroom. Homework is assigned every day. So these are, again, super different ways of, of actually asking for the homework back, as opposed to actually just being in school and being able to hand in the homework. First of all, the gym teacher, those assignments, they're uploaded Sunday night. Sunday night is not when kids are thinking about class. So that would be really easy for a student to do the assignment and then just forget to hand it in because it's Sunday night. Also every other week. I don't know about you, but I am bad at judging every other week. Did I do that last week or two weeks ago? That's another thing that's really easy just to kind of miss and accidentally have the homework not be turned in. And also it's a video sometimes and then through Google Docs, whereas it's an entirely different system for the math teacher. So a student can't just go through and say, okay, I've done my assigns and assignments and turned them in. They have to do the IXL problems by logging into the account. I don't know about you, but how many times have you tried to log into an account and you don't have your password and you don't know what your login is? And then even if you want to do it, you can't do it. So that's another barrier. So there's just layers and layers and layers of EF barriers. So we have to see what we can do to take away those things so our students can actually show what they know. Okay, how does he know if assignment is missing? All right, so as opposed to a teacher just telling you the assignment is missing, um, Cameron has to see for the gym teacher. Once an assignment is late, it is marked as turned in on Google Classroom to show that the due date has passed. The student can check their online grades on Veracross to see if it has been marked as zero. So if the assignment isn't done, it still is marked as turned in. So that's something that even though you could check it somewhere else to see that it's not turned in, um, a lot of kids are just gonna see like, I guess I turned it in and not think about it. So that's something where you can fall down. Now for the math teacher, assignments will be left open, highlighted blue on the classroom until they have been turned in. So if you have two different classes, one where if it's not turned in, it can kind of look that way. And the other one that is training you that if it's not turned in, it's still blue. That's gonna be another place where it's gonna be easy just to miss things. Um, and homework grades are calculated and entered on Veracross twice per quarter. So that's something where the gym teacher is telling you to basically check bear across all the time, whereas the math teacher is like, it'll be checked twice a quarter. So we can't get those systems in place to help Cameron be as supported as he can, even when his teachers aren't in the room with him. Okay. So the shift towards remote and hybrid instruction has raised the EF expectations of our students um, that our students face by a lot. And that is uh, just by, there's, there's no way around it, obviously, but we, I think it's really, really helpful and really important to actually break down and to think, okay, what are all the steps that a student has to do to turn in their work? Not just uh, sort of think, yeah, they turn in their work and this is how they do it, but like actually think through all the little things they need to do and how those might, uh, those friction points might be rubbing up in a way that is uh, hard to visualize if you're not really getting into the nitty gritty. Um, and then at the same time, the support we're able to give the students has decreased. And of course we want to give them all the support we can, but it's really hard to figure out what to do. Um, and so we're gonna work together a little bit and we're gonna kind of brainstorm some ways that we can try to nudge some things that we're, that students are doing independently right now to back to with support. All right, so this is the whole result is a, a ton of uh, a ton of clocked funnels. So again, as we said before, this is it's not that the student doesn't know how to do the work. It's that they can't get the work to you because there's all this EF pressure. OK. Um, it's me, right? Yes, it okay, is. Cool. <laughs> Um, so, you know, so one, like I said, I don't want us to, I don't want anyone to come out of here thinking, you know, we're doomed, we cannot do this. Um, but I just want to kind of underscore kind of what's at stake here. I've seen a lot of posts that say, you know, don't worry if they don't get fractions this year, we're going to get them next year. And I believe that. However, remember that when kids are having these EF challenges, it's not just their EF that struggles. Their self-understanding of who they are suffers, their self-concept their belief in their ability to succeed and their motivation and effort can struggle as well. So 
I think that it's a, a watchword for this year is bringing in some strategies that support the student so that we can maintain their personal goals for themselves and their belief and their ability to succeed, okay? Um, so fractions are important, but the self-understanding and the belief in yourself and the effort are most important. And by supporting kids' EF needs and bringing in strategies, you can kind of initiate a positive cycle of success in those areas. So um, as we kind of get into how, so how are we gonna do that, Michael? What are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna tell you. Um, so the way, I mean, th this has not changed with setting, it's just become a little more complicated. The way you do it is you bring strategies in that match the demands. If we know a student is struggling in a certain area, we give them strategies in that area. And by giving them explicit instruction in those strategies, what you do is you take something out of that can't do yet area of the circle and you bring it into the with support. You don't leave them in the wilderness to do it on their own. You give them a strategy, you give them the tools to face that challenge, okay? So we're going to identify those clog funnels and we're gonna bring in those strategies right there. Um, so you remember this, all right, this is me being that math teacher, and we're just going to add a column right there. Okay, we're going to add a column that says, how can I adapt in the remote or hybrid setting to support a student in that area? And um, we've given you a blank planner that you can do this on your own, but we're going to do an example together. We're going to use some of those clog funnels from this, um, from this presentation and do it together. So here was one of the clog funnels, oops, sorry. This is just that one model, Oops, let me go back, there we go, okay. Um, so this is one problem, right? Um, students aren't practicing the problems independently. So what can I do? What are some strategies? I can put them in breakout rooms and have them talk to each other. I can give them a problem solving checklist that they have to talk themselves through. Um, this third one, I've seen some math teachers do this and I love it, have them actually talk it out and record it and submit that as part of a do now or something like that to check their understanding. So by creating the structure around them, I'm not leaving them in the can't do yet bubble, okay? So we're gonna go through a couple together and then we're gonna crowdsource it. I want you in the chat to give me some ideas for the next clog funnel. Okay, and Elizabeth, can you exit the presentation mode for me? Yes, I can. Okay, so I can do the typing directly. Okay, so my next clog funnel is what is it? Uh, yes. So students not feeling confident to ask for help. So my students are struggling, but they're not asking me for help. So in the chat, what can I do to create a structure or a strategy where students can ask me for help or I can make sure that they'll ask me for help? Does anyone have any great ideas that they can put in the chat? Make a poll. Ooh, yes, polls. And um, while we're doing polls, we can also do some annotation games. You know, have you noticed that we really like those? They're like really fun. Oh yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, that's a great one. I've also seen the like fist to five, you know, how confident are you feeling, zero to five. Yeah, private messages, exactly. I mean, the private messaging is there. Um, Ooh, yes, a Google form. I love that Google yep. form parking lot, answer questions, just a just general place to keep questions. Yep, and you know what's so wonderful about that is it's also gonna help you feel more confident in this is landing. Because one thing that's really different, like if we were doing this live, I would see all a hundred something of you and be able to talk to you, but now I can't. And I'm like, are they paying attention? I think they are. Um, that was great. Oh, sorry, I lost myself no, that a little bit. Okay. Um, next one. So students are struggling. Oh, Flipgrid. Yes, Flipgrid is what I was talking about with those videos. They, they love that. I'm a big fan of it. Um, now my students aren't completing their work on their own. This is a big one. So uh, this is a, one that's a perennial struggle, but I'm having trouble having my students do their homework. Um, what are some strategies I can do to try to get some of that homework from them um, that they're, so they're supposed to be doing independently and I'm getting nothing back. What is a way that I can take it out of that independent, um, you're on your own and create a structure around them to be successful with their remote learning homework? What do you think? Um, yes, yeah, so email to the home, you know, email to the home, you know, parents are looking for guidance. Um, yes, providing time during class. I think, I think that's actually really valuable. And it's, you know, a year ago, if you had told me that, okay, I'm gonna put all the kids on a computer and we're gonna do homework together, that would not be a good idea, I would have thought, but actually it's worked really well for some of my students. Um, okay. Rooms. We've got 
breakout Ooh, yes. group, breakout rooms yeah peer group breakouts good a goal sheet is great um homework club yes i'm gonna join the homework club awesome okay um by the way we can save the chat so if anyone wants these ideas in a chat just let us know all right, let's do one more and then uh, we'll keep going. But I think you're getting the high idea of it. So now my students aren't turning their work in. I did it. I swear I did it. Why did you mark it as zero? Because remember, they don't remember they didn't turn it in. They're not like, oh, I forgot to turn it in. Why do I have a zero? They're not turning their work in. So what am I going to do? How can I take it out of the can't do yet and make it support, make it supported? Yeah, homework checklist is a great idea. Love that. Um, yeah, submit at the beginning of class. I think that's one of the biggest changes. You know, before you had to ask kids to turn in their homework when they were in class. And there are a lot of prompts, a visual a prompt of everyone else doing it, the audio prompt, the, hey, why isn't your homework? Um, so doing it there. Ooh, the percentage of the percentage turned in, I think is a really interesting idea. So kids can see they're not alone. And the weekly work, the weekly um, missing list. So that kid Cameron, who I told you is one of my students, that's not his name and that some of the details have been changed, but creating that weekly list helped him tremendously because it took so much effort. Elizabeth kind of talked you through how hard it was for him to know what he was actually missing. So helping him find that list really helped um, him use his effort to get caught back up. Excellent, good, good. Such great teachers in the room. That, These are that fantastic. makes me very happy. Um, okay, so you can see how if I took some of those and put those, and you can get it back in presentation mode if you want, Elizabeth. Um, if you, if we took some of those and put them in that last column, I would be building supports around my students' most vulnerable areas so that they're not being left in the can't do yet. The funnels are not clogged and, and lonely or whatever. They have the strategies they need to kind of be successful and keep going. Um, okay. So, you have a blank worksheet. And Caitlin, do you want to paste that blank worksheet in there one more time? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so this is a worksheet that you can use. It's, it just looks just like this, but it's blank. So you can kind of take that area. Is it homework? Is it projects? Is it focusing during Zoom? And talk through those steps and really analyze what's shifted in setting between in-person and remote and think about what strategies you can bring in there. Um, this is a great thing to brainstorm with colleagues as well, because the more consistent approaches we can build in between teachers can really help. You know, those math and gym examples were real. And I don't judge those teachers. They had to whip together a class at last minute. Honestly, I saw those gym activities and I was like, I want to do that. He's doing Pilates, he's doing whatever. I'm just in the computer for eight hours. But the inconsistencies between them are really kind of causing this student to fail and this is a junior in high school. So the more we can brainstorm with our colleagues um, on these remote hybrid adaptations, the better things will be. Um, so we're going to select those strategies to reduce the demands. And you know, one thing you might notice if you've been coming to these webinars, so we didn't do a smart strategy today because we wanted to make sure that we were as broad as possible in this very challenging time. However, there are many smart strategies that you can use to unclog those funnels. You can check out the free lesson on smarts. You can also um, take a look at previous webinars or join us for those um, trainings starting in February with Lynn, with Dr. Meltzer, um, to, to learn more about how to use those explicit strategies. Or you can email me. I love talking to you. Um, so we are going to talk through five steps that you can kind of use to talk yourself and your colleagues and whomever else through this process, okay? Um, okay, so five steps. So the first one, oh, I already... I always do this, I always get ahead of myself. I think I said this, I'm gonna say it again with the slide. So the first one is really evaluate that shift. What changed between the way things used to be that your students were used to and the expectations that they're facing now? And if we can analyze those, that will give you a great place to start. Okay, the step two is teach strategies explicitly. This is uh, the thing that we say for every training, every webinar that we do, it's not enough just to sort of fold in a strategy. The student needs to know what the strategy is, what it does so that they can use it in different contexts. And you have to show your students what success actually looks like. What does a, what is exactly what you want? So that they're not guessing. So they're not working a whole lot on something that is kind of to the left of what you want. And then they put all this effort into something that doesn't get a payoff for them. Exactly. 
Um, so this is one that I think you actually identified in some of your ideas, but make time for these supports and strategies, right? So one of the reasons that so many of those clog funnels are appearing, so many more independent expectations are popping up is we're asking them to do stuff when we're not together. Um, checking their homework, identifying you know, what the missing homework is, et cetera. So the more you can make time in your instruction, your time with your kiddos, um, the more successful those strategies will be. And I really, so like, for example, that I am reminding kids to turn in their homework when class starts. Um, it's a small thing. It will make a big, big difference. Having them do that goal setting while you're in class together. By doing that, by starting the strategy together and modeling it explicitly, as Elizabeth said, you've really set them up to be successful before they head out into the independent you know, part of their day. So taking that time beforehand and do yourself a favor and identify that time you know, early on, be proactive. You, know, you don't wanna be halfway through your lesson and be like, oh, I forgot to do it at the beginning. If you build it into your lesson planning, if you set a reminder or put it into your daily agenda, you'll have done your future self a big favor by creating that time for strategies and ensuring that the strategies will actually be taught. Okay, and step four, don't forget to reflect. So ask students to reflect on their strategy use. And this is another thing that we stress constantly because students will learn a strategy and if they don't reflect on it, that strategy, it just leaves their brain. So it's like you have to do that reflecting to make sure that all the work you did teaching them the strategy is really useful. So you have to remember to help students understand their strengths and challenges. Then you have they have to reflect on their performance and they have to make plans for next time so that you're actually having them think, what did I do in the past? What did I do during class with this present? And what am I going to do next time? Yeah, that reflection, we can't stress it enough because if you do the strategy one time and you never reflect on how it went, you just, you're going to lose it. You're not going to see the long-term gains you want to see in that area or in executive function long-term. Um, so really think about those opportunities for reflection. And step five is actually related to that one. So I'm saying model flexibility and persistence. Um, what I think I mean by that in the most basic way is if something's not working, if you're concerned about how something is going, there's nothing wrong with being upfront about that with your students and saying, I'm sorry um, on the, you know, I'm giving you this PDF and I thought you'd be able to fill it this way and it's not working for me. Or, you know, I'm having, I thought I'd be able to grade these things by now, no problem. Because it's really hard when you hide your executive function from kids, they don't understand how important it is. In the other ones, we've talked about organization, kids have no idea how much organizing we do, that's a whole other story. But it's the same with the adaptation for this year. I've had students who say, well, I had this teacher before and we had a final, but I have no idea if we're gonna have a final, okay? Um, or we haven't had any tests, what's our grade for you? Know, there's so much um, in the dark around the structures of classes right now because teachers don't know. And teachers like to present really polished, um, beautiful, finished things to their students. But if you can share some of the flexibility and persistence that you're experiencing with your kids, you're actually gonna be modeling um, some really good executive function for them. You're gonna be showing them how you're adapting and devising strategies and changing those strategies as you go. And the other piece of it is you might learn some things that you didn't know. Um, that Kami or Kami or whatever that Elizabeth mentioned before. So that's a Google Chrome extension that you can use to write on PDFs. Well, I'll tell you, I was working with a teacher in New Jersey and they were having trouble using the SMARTS handouts, even though they're fillable, it just wasn't working in their classroom. And a student says, have you tried Kami? And now half the school is using it. So that one kid taught that teacher something because the teacher was upfront about the challenge. And now half of this high school is using that extension. So we can all learn from each other in this very trying time. We can all support each other. And remember, we're not just supporting executive function. We're also supporting each other as self-understanding, self-concept and motivation and effort. So model your challenges, model your revisions and bring your students into that process. I actually loved a lot of your um, ideas before were like collecting data from students, um, which help you learn on your teaching. So I think that's an important thing to end with. You don't, this is a challenging year and we know there's been a lot of suffering, you know, in general, but also in schools and education. That's not 
unique to students, teachers too. So why suffer alone? Let's suffer together and learn a bit from each other. And that will change that setting that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, so yeah, so that is, so that's all I've got. And actually, I can't believe we might even have two or three minutes for questions. That has not happened in quite a <laughs> long time. Um, Elizabeth, if you want to fly, why don't you keep our emails up though? Yeah. So, um, you know, and I'll let Elizabeth has a whole spiel at the end, but I will say we love executive function. We love learning with you. So please do not be a stranger. You Now you have our emails. I would love to hear from you, your questions, your concerns. If you're a smarts educator and you want to do some brainstorming, we've got you. If you're not a smarts educator and you want to talk executive function, we've got you. So please don't hesitate and don't be a stranger. Um, Elizabeth, it's all you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, so we've just, uh, uh, Caitlin, our fabulous audience tech support has put the link to the evaluation in the chat, just like we want to uh, have to prompt our students to do their reflections. We want to prompt you to do a reflection for us as well. Uh, and as I said, we, they're absolutely invaluable to us. So uh, we would love it if you did that. Um, again, you will be getting a recording of this webinar and we will uh, put together a, uh, Everything that I'm saying right now, we're going to basically put it into the email so that you will have it all. And that those of you who want certificates, you fill out the evaluation and then it'll fill in your information on that. And then we will contact you to basically uh, get you that certificate. So again, that's $15 there. Um, and then I also just want to, uh, can we put in the, uh, the discount code? for our paid training uh, series. Again, thank you so much. The Executive Function Toolbox Training Series. So then uh, this code is $20 off, just flat for each session. Um, and that expires on the 22nd. So there's a lot of really, really fantastic information there. Um, so I think that's most of the, we kind of went over all of those before. So I think we're Good for now. Um, again, so we uh, the also also the uh, webinar for the video recording of our last webinar is now open to the public. So feel free to share it around with all of your friends and such. I'm also going to put into the chat here. Here is a list of all of our various uh, social media links and all of our various websites. We would love it if you followed us. Uh, we're always uh, posting new interesting things from us and also from just the world of education. Um, also, all of our free webinars are up on our YouTube channel and you can just go watch them anytime you want. And we also put blogs up on our SMARTS website every single week, uh, written by the two of us and Caitlin and, and others. Um, and that is just some great content that is always available to you. So yeah, yeah I think we have Yes. So someone asked a great question on how do you support parents? And, you know, when it comes to executive function, that question has always been kind of talk about being left out in the cold, right? That gap between bridge to home and school is a huge one. And actually, if you if you were joined us for our um, EF webinars last spring, we had one on bridge to home to school. So check out our YouTube and you can watch the recording of that one. Um, however, the principles are pretty similar. So I think there's two great things you can do for parents. One is, you know, especially in those areas of clogged funnels, spell out the expectations really explicitly. So that student, Cameron, uh, you know, one thing the teacher did was recorded herself finding all the homework and sent that to the parents because the parents didn't know how to use Google Classroom. I mean, you know, if the kid's struggling, the parents are really struggling. So by giving them a really, once again, modeling what success looks like and sharing that with the kids or the parents and the kids, here's what my expectations are, here's how you do it. And providing that really explicit support is a great thing for parents to do. Um, the other really important thing to do, and you nailed it with the students, but it's important for parents too, is get feedback from the parents. Um, they are seeing things, I mean, they always see things that you don't see, but they're really seeing things you don't see now. Um, you know, as teachers, if we see that a camera is off and we're really worried our student is being lazy or lollygagging or watching YouTube videos about the Red Sox, the truth is they might be, you know, I mean, it could be that they're like crying in the corner because they're feeling really down. It honestly could be that they love the fact that they don't have to put their camera on because they're very self-conscious and they actually like that part of remote learning. So collect data from the parents, get the, a weekly like reflection sheet is a great, great idea. Um, let's see. Let's see what we got. I see some people um, who are interested in more around smarts. 
Um, that's so, you know, we love, we love, of course we love smarts. We love smarts. It's a great, powerful tool. Um, when you fill out the evaluation, you can check a box to get a free lesson or more information on smarts as well as training, etc. cetera. Um, if you are using the smarts curriculum, you are definitely a smarts educator. You're part of the smarts family that comes with the curriculum. It comes with assessment tools. It comes with discounts to trainings. Um, it comes with, you know, gathering, you know, smarts conversations, lots of great, great stuff. So yes, welcome to the Smarts family, to those of you who are in it, and don't be a stranger there. Um, I do see someone says, is there a format for to-do list that you have found most intuitive for middle school students? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Hmm. That's, uh, see, that's the problem is that uh, to really have effective strategies, it has to be individual. Like it just, nothing works for all students. And that's actually another reason why the reflection is so important because you're not just reflecting on the strategy. The student has to reflect on how did the strategy work for me? How did it not work for me? And we really encourage that if the strategy doesn't work for a student, the strategy should change. It should suit them. So like, I can't think of a one size fits all sort of strategy yeah. for that, you know, but it's, it's kind of has to be got down and basically be like, why is this to do list not working? Yeah. Try to figure that out. Um, but what I really like about that question is, you know, because to do lists are not just a static like bam, 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 bam. So this questioner asks, you know, should it be newest? Should it be by uh, due date? Should it be by priority? Should it be, you know, old to new, new to old? So that might be actually something that you try in different ways with your students and say, do you like it this way? Do you like it that way? You might actually have them sort it that way. Or um, so once again, Cameron, his ears are probably burning right now. He has this giant list of catch up homework. And what he eventually decided he had to do was do new to old because he was doing things that were two months old and he was falling behind with what was happening currently in class. And he's the one who told me that because I had it old to new because I was like, you're going to catch up. But when it became clear that he wouldn't catch up quickly, he told me, I, you know, it was his idea. I'll give him credit. Um, I like the idea of students kind of picking, highlight the five assignments you're going to get done before I see you next time. So giving them some input on that will actually make that individualization that Elizabeth mentioned a lot easier. And then uh, I saw uh, Peggy there was talking about uh, Google Tasks. I very much agree. Uh, anything that you can do, tech doesn't work for everybody. But when you can use tech that specifically integrates with other tech so that it's not something that you just put it on to do list and then the to do list is never looked at, that there are alerts or something that is involved with a calendar so that it's actually showing you when. Exactly. Oh, that was great. Um, all right. So I think that we are at time and, you know, we got to respect we got to respect uh, time management when you do executive function. But I first, I just want to say thank you so much, Elizabeth, for leading us through this. I really was. A, it's always a pleasure working with you. But to work with you in front of an audience is even more of a pleasure because you're natural. Um, and Michael, one more time. Oh, yes, I'm blushing. You can't tell there's a zoom <laughs> blushing filter. Um, but one more time, do not be a stranger. We love executive function. We are supporting you and the success of your students. Fill out that evaluation. Tell us we can get to you. Copy down our emails. Reach out with your questions. Um, you know, this is an interesting year. I keep waiting that normalcy. It's I don't know. It's somewhere. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna be promote some success for our kids. We're gonna get through this year, and we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Absolutely.